Hello. Oh, thank you. Thanks. Uh, if you would, indulge me for a minute before we get started. And take one hand, left or right, doesn't matter. Stick it under your chin. Sort of, look, you're all doing it. Wow. Look down your elbow and lift and lower your pinky finger. And you can't see it on my arm because I'm wearing a coat. But, and most of you are wearing long sleeves, so this may not work out so well. There's a tiny little muscle right here that only moves, there, there you go, pull up your sleeve, that only moves when you flex your pinky finger. I want you to put that idea of that pinky muscle in a box. Keep it in the back of your head, but I promise we'll come back to it later, okay? The theme of this year's TEDx event is Modern Renaissance, and I'm pleased to be here as the, to talk with you all as the co-director of the Fusion Studio for Entertainment and Engineering here at Purdue and as a faculty member in the Department of Theater. Um, there should be a slide. I'm not sure why it's not coming up. There it is. Walt Whitman, in Song of Myself, wrote, Do I contradict myself? Very well, then, I contradict myself. I am large. I contain multitudes. I love this quote. I come back to this throughout my life. I love this because the idea that we contain multitudes means that we're not tiny, narrow, easily described beings. We're complicated. We can contain multiple things in our head at the same time. For example, I love building Legos with my son, and I can, at one moment, be really excited about this thing that we built together that we spent time on and is sort of beautiful in its own way. And at the very same moment, when he tears it apart to build something else, I can be incredibly disappointed that he's taken apart something that we built together. In the same moment, I can be proud of something he's done and be sad about something that he's done, right? I can contain multitudes. I also want to talk about this related term, liminality. Liminality is a state of transition between one stage and the next, right? Especially between stages in our lives as we grow. Think about, for many of you may have gone to family Thanksgiving when you're like 12 or 13 years old, right? In that moment, you want to both be accepted at the adult's table, but still desperately want to play with the kids, right? It's a moment where we live between two places. We are not really a child, but not really an adult. It's a state of liminality. One of the things that's important about liminality is that it's a state that's accompanied by a feeling of vulnerability, a feeling of uncomfortableness, and a feeling of tension. Put that in that box that we talked about earlier, too, with that pinky finger muscle. We'll come back to it. There we go. In November, I had the really fortunate opportunity to do something I have dreamt about for a few years. I was in Orlando, and I got to go to Hollywood Studios in uh, Disney World and ride the Rise of the Resistance ride at the Galaxy's Edge part of uh, you know, uh, Disneyland, right? Uh, I promise I won't spoil the ride for you all if you haven't done it, but this was amazing. If you haven't done it, you got to go do it, right? I spent the entire ride in the state of total bliss. You start an, uh, in a line that is immersed around you with scenery, and you're dragged through this narrative that's immersive in all of these environments that culminates in this wild ride on a cart through the belly of a spaceship that's driven by a robot. And for real, it's a robot. There's no person driving it, it's a computer, right? And throughout that entire ride, I did not stop laughing the whole time. I'm just giggling and laughing riotously with joy. Pure, childlike bliss. At the same time, I can't help but think about the hows of this ride. How did the robot driver know where to move the cart? How did that work? How did the animatronics know when to trigger to make these things appear around me while the ride was going on? How was it that a drop of only a couple of inches in the cart made me feel like I was dropping hundreds of feet out of a spaceship? Even while I was enjoying this emotional experience of living in this world that I wanted to live in since I was a kid, Star Wars, at the same time I was thinking about the ridiculous engineering that went into action to make that experience happen for me. In that moment, I contained multitudes. Somebody's controlling my clicker. We're here today to talk about the modern Renaissance, right? 
But when we think about the Renaissance, we think about this explosion of art that happened after years uh, in the Dark Ages, the Middle Ages, right? All throughout Europe, all this amazing, beautiful art gets created, paintings and sculptures, uh, things that we still talk about and look at today, hundreds of years later. At the same time, there was this rebirth of scientific exploration, of curiosity about the world around us, right? And this was happening by many of the same people. The people who were creating art were also exploring what the world around us was like. In a weird way, 700 years ago, there was no difference between artistic exploration and scientific exploration. At that time, it was all the same thing. It was all people expressing their curiosity about the world, trying to find ways to know more, to see more, and to say more about how the world worked. I find that fascinating because today we live at a time where we bifurcate the two, where we say there is science and there is art. But maybe there isn't science and art. Maybe there isn't STEM over here and liberal arts over here. Maybe they're the same thing. Maybe that bifurcation is something we've created that isn't real. I think we've trained ourselves to think that way, and I think we can retrain ourselves to bring them together, to allow all of us, me and all of you, to contain multitudes, science and art together. There was one artist in the Renaissance. You might have heard of him, some guy named Da Vinci, right? A couple of chuckles. Some of you know who he is. That's good. The rest of you should take an art history class, probably. Da Vinci, what you may not know about Da Vinci, is that much of his early career, and then throughout the rest of his career, but a lot of it in his early career, was spent creating props, costumes, and scenic devices for uh, religious pageant plays for his sponsors, his patrons, the Medici family. I find that fascinating. Very few of us know about that, but he spent his time doing theater. I'm in theater, I love that. Some of the earliest drawings in his sketchbooks are of flying machines, right? Many of them are props for shows, articulated birds that wings that fly, that kind of thing. You may recognize this drawing, the aerial screw, right? It is often considered the first drawing of a human-powered helicopter. Some authors suggest that perhaps this gave, was given birth as a machine to allow actors portraying angels to descend from the heavens during a pageant play. It wasn't a way to make people fly. It was a way to make people look like they were flying. And that's kind of cool. What's interesting about da Vinci is that he never veered away from this. Throughout his life, he continued to explore the way things flew. His notebooks are filled with drawings of how birds flew, with other automatons that he created or wanted to create, and also human-powered flight. He never gave up on this idea. He continued to explore it. And some authors suggest that this early work, creating birds for theatrical productions or machines to make people fly on stage, informed his later scientific curiosity about human-powered flight. I submit to you that that may not be the case, that maybe they were both just expressions of the same curiosity. How does the world work? One didn't inform the other. They lived together. He contained multitudes. That's kind of why I love what I do. I live in this space of live performance and engineering, where I get to find ways to create the visions that others create, that others dream up, using science, engineering, and technology. I get to live in a space that's not bifurcated between art and science. I get to live in a space that's both at the same time. It's worth saying I consider myself as much a teacher as I do a theatrical practitioner. That's a big part of my world. I'm also really fortunate that not only do I get to live in that non-bifurcated world, but I get to create a space for students to find a home there as well. Students who are interested in both, I get to find a space for them to not be bifurcated. Let me tell you about one student in particular, Amanda. Amanda came to me as she was in high school. She showed up on a campus visit. We sat in the theater and she said, I want to study theater engineering and I saw on the website that I can do it at Purdue. And I chuckled and I said, I, I have no idea what that means wasn't such a thing as far as I knew. And I said, but I bet we can figure it out. 
and she came to Purdue, and we did. We worked out a plan of study for her to study, take engineering classes and classes in technology for live entertainment, and to create them into a sort of combined engineering and theater degree. And that plan of study became the template for the theater engineering concentration that students take now at Purdue, which is kind of exciting all by itself that she got to create that for folks, right? So fast forward to her senior year. She's working on her senior capstone design, and we have set it up so that she is working on creating a mechanism that would allow a steamer trunk to tumble down the stairs on the set in this production of Clybourne Park. And her job was to find a way to make that happen predictably, repeatably, and safely. She works for eight to 10 weeks on this project. She does all sorts of research. She does low fidelity prototypes and high fidelity prototypes, small scale prototypes and big scale prototypes, computer modeling, all sorts of work. She comes up with this really interesting design that would involve a, a metal shaft going diagonally down the steps and this trunk tumbling around that shaft. And she creates this intricate sort of lobed inverted hole that would allow it to tumble exactly to match how the steps were built. Does that make sense? And we get to the time where she has to implement it. I'll show you a picture. There it is. So she's connected it to the motor, right, that we have in stock. She's connected the motor to the control system. She's put the shaft in. Everything's in place. She tests it. She runs it. And it works. It's magic. It didn't quite work the first time, but the story's better if it worked. It worked, everything worked correctly. It went down the steps, it tumbled end over end, it looked like a trunk falling down the steps. Except it didn't look right. Everything worked correctly, but it didn't look right. Anybody guess why it didn't look right? One word, uh, kind of, another word, gravity. Sound is a good word too, but gravity is the word we're looking for. We could be here all day, but I only got 15 minutes, so gravity is the word we're looking for. Gravity, we all know this, gravity continues to pull its stuff until it stops falling, right? Which means it continues to accelerate down the steps the whole time. The control system that Amanda hadn't purchased or had any control over couldn't simulate that. She couldn't make it do that. And so it traveled at a set speed and it didn't look right. She had to make a hard decision. She had to decide, do we continue trying with this or do we cut it from the show? She decided she's not going to be able to make it work. She had to cut it. She had to talk to the crew, the team, and say, it's not going to work. We have to do something else. Her project failed, but the production was successful. The actors learned how to make the trunk fall safely. It worked every night. Nobody got hurt. It looked great. Without her failure, we would not have learned that the acceleration was what mattered, that it needed to keep going faster and faster and faster until, bam, it stopped, to have that moment of tension in the play. It's a liminal state success and failure, right? She needed to fail to succeed. Remember Da Vinci? I'll take you back to that guy. He kept drawing birds and flying machines, but I think we all know he never flew, right? But his whole life he kept coming back to it, finding, exploring ways for how flight would work. He tried and he tried and he tried it again. And each time, unfortunately, he failed. But he kept trying. Let me leave you with a couple of things before we go. Part of my job as an instructor is to help students be comfortable in that liminal space, that space of success and failure at the same time they're exploring art and science, to be comfortable with that vulnerable, uncomfortable, tense space, that liminal space, right? So as you leave here today, think about a couple of things. First, think about that tiny muscle in your pinky or in your elbow that controls your pinky. This is Michelangelo's Moses. It's a sculpture designed to capture the feeling of being uh, filled with God's power as Moses came down with the laws on the commandments to deliver them to the people. I submit to you that only an artist who was both familiar with what he wanted to try to create, this feeling of compressed and ready to spring emotion, 
and human anatomy could remember that the flexure of that tiny muscle that only moves when the pinky moves could help create this beautiful piece of artwork that would let us see that feeling. In that moment of creating this, he contained multitudes. I also submit to you the second thing to go away with. If you think for a minute that he got it right the first time, you're crazy, right? He sketched it, and he sketched it again, and he had Moses sitting this way, and he had Moses sitting that way, and he had Moses holding the, ta ta the tablets in a bunch of different ways. He had to try a bunch of things that didn't work. He had to fail and fail and fail again until he finally succeeded. Thank you very much.